So uh, we're going to get started. So thank you so much for everyone for coming today. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about progressive web applications using React. So who am I? I'm that guy in the picture. Uh, thank you, Photoshop, for making me look good, kind of. Uh, I look better in Photoshop than in person. Um, I'm a staff developer advocate for PayPal. I'm also a community member of different communities, such as uh, Google Developer Express Program. Uh, thank you, Google, for paying for my trip to all things open. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm an Auth0 ambassador. I'm a AWS community builder, Postman Supernova, Twilio champion, media developer expert Cloudinary, and a Google woman take maker. So anyone knows what is a PWA here? Raise your hand. So one, two, okay, we got a couple of hands, awesome. So if you see something that is not right, just raise your hand and be like, hey, Pato, that is not correct. You suck, and then we just move into the next slide. Um, so what is a PWA? A PWA stands for Progressive Web Application. For me, a PWA is a regular web app with superpowers, right? It's nothing crazy going on that you have to put in the app store or something like that. It's just a regular web app just with superpowers. One of the questions that I get very, very often is, who uses a PWA? Nobody uses that. Well, that's actually not right. Uh, there's like thousands of companies that like big companies who are using um, PWAs. For example, every time that you swipe right um, on Tinder, you gotta thank it to a PWA. Google, Samsung, and Microsoft, they spend millions of dollars a year to make sure that developer experience and the user experience in progressive web applications, it's better every year. So definitely thank them. Uh, Starbucks, Adidas, PayPal, Lyft, Uber, CSX, and many, many more are using progressive web applications. If you're into uh, Twitter, Twitter is a progressive web app, right? So a problem that I've been seeing with a lot of people is that they think just because you're not installing the application in your device, that is not a progressive web application, and that is wrong. So keep that in mind. So this is an awesome website, just in case you want to go to your boss and tell him, hey, buddy, we should convert our application or we should build an application as a progressive web app. Well, this uh, website right here, people with stats, is gonna give you numbers, right? Like at the end of the day, every company wants to make money. And progressive web applications, believe it or not, are gonna help you increase uh, the sales of your, of your uh, company and you're gonna have more uh, revenue at the end of the year. So for example, let's take a look to some of these inter interesting stats. Can everyone hear me right? I feel like some echo in the background, sounds kind of weird. But um, maybe I just hate listening to myself, that, that could be too. Um, so for example, let's see, let's keep scrolling down. Da, 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 da. For example, let's take a look to the one on Tinder. So if everyone know what, what Tinder is, basically it's a love matching app, I guess. That's how you would like to call it. <laughs> um, but um, basically Tinder, they, they used to have this application and it will take 11.91 seconds to load. And they took it down to 4.69 seconds just by converting into PWA. Now, um, as you can see, the PWA is 90% smaller than the native Android application, which is insane. Let's take a look to another one right here. Let's see, another one that you guys may know. For example, this one from Forbes. Uh, Forbes PWA loads is in 2.5 seconds on mobile compared to 6.5 seconds for its previous site. Impression for visits are up now 10%. And this is just like super tiny. There's companies who have increased like crazy just by converting to a PWA. And I'm gonna tell you the story of what happened to me with a client. So now that we've been talking about superpowers, what are the superpowers of a progressive web application? A progressive web application is more than just installing a web application into a device. We can do more than that. A progressive web application, like I said, you can install it, is SEO friendly. You can use push notifications for your marketing campaigns so just to interact with your users. It's extremely performant. It increases the user experience for different reasons. Why? Because you can use it offline, which how many websites do you know that you can use offline? Right. It's super rare, right? But if you use a, P a progressive web application, 
you can do so, and then you're gonna increase the user experience, which means more people are gonna stay in your website. You can do uh, payment processing, like PayPal, Apple Pay, Google Pay, and many more, and progressive web applications are multi-platform, meaning you don't have to develop an application for Android, you don't have to uh, develop an application for iOS, you basically write JavaScript, and then you have your application in iOS, in your uh, laptop, in your Android, you can have it even in your uh, iWatch or whatever. So my device is currently offline, so I need to connect, that is great, all things open. I don't know the password, so I apologize for that, so I guess I'm just gonna connect to my to my hotspot, but this is a perfect example of a PWA. Uh, it's ATO. Explanation, Mark, okay, there you go. Like that? Let's see. Well, uh, this is a perfect example of a PWA, uh, real, real time. As you saw, there was a sign that said offline. Now it doesn't have it because we're actually connected to the internet. And this website was fully working thanks to the powers of a progressive web application. And well, if I'm gonna, if I keep scrolling down, these are some of the features that I didn't mention in my slide about uh, the superpowers, but you can do many, many things. For example, you can access the file system, you can use the NFC API, you can use the Bluetooth API, and many, many APIs that we have out there on the web. So, as you may know, like I've been talking about all the cool things about a progressive web application, but what are the disadvantages of a progressive web app? The answer is zero. Like everything is perfect, beautiful, I'm kidding. Uh, I wish it was like that. But there are some disadvantages. One of the most important ones, in my personal opinion, is the caching. Caching can be your friend or can be your enemy. And when I say your enemy, is because it's very hard sometimes to debug things when things are cached. Because you might be looking at the old version of your website. So that can get like pretty tricky, and then depends on your caching strategy, your cache is gonna expire, and so on. Uh, another disadvantage is uh, less access to system features, right? Uh, if you compare it to a native application like an Android app, um, there's not such a thing as review standards. This is what I mean. Whenever you develop an Android or iOS app and you push it into the App Store, there's someone in the background from Apple I'm gonna be like, ah, yeah, I'm um, code police and your code sucks. This is not gonna make it to, to the App Store, but we have TikTok. So whatever that means, right? Um, so there's no one reviewing that. Meaning you can push a PWA like you push any regular website. So you can put whatever you want in there. And uh, the other disadvantage is that Apple needs to catch up with the technology. One of the examples is push notifications. If you are on a device, if I'm not mistaken, for example, an iPhone, if you have the iOS version less than 15, you are not able to get push notifications through a website. You're able to do it through a native app, but not through a website. But if you have a Mac, you can still get them. It doesn't matter the version that you have. So, why did I fall in love with progressive web applications? This is based on a true story. So back in the days, I used to work for a consultancy, actually from Raleigh, uh, fun fact. And they assigned me to a project to one of our clients, and this client basically told us, hey guys, we want to reach more countries, we want to have more users, we want to make more money, we want to make your, our application more performant, what can we do? So after some research, we decided to convert their application into a progressive web app. And this is what happened. Uh, now the application from our client is in over 100, 100, 120 countries, one out of five Americans have products from our clients. So basically, I don't know how many people we have here, maybe like, I don't know, like 70. So you do the math, there's like a little bit over 10 people that have uh, products from our clients. So thank you so much for paying my paycheck. Um, uh, also, we were able to reduce the server calls thanks to the caching strategies. And by us reducing the server calls by 32%, means that we didn't have to make that many calls to uh, our cloud providers, which means we were saving money. Uh, we also increased the number of users by millions. 
we improve the user experience, and products were easier to find on the web. This is what I mean, because you're able to use SEO. Compared to a native application, you don't have SEO, right? So this is a huge advantage on PWAs. Uh, the PWA load time was around uh, three seconds, which is amazing. You usually want to keep the load time of your application around three seconds, but definitely keep it less than five. Because if not, you're gonna lose like half of your users. By 2019, our client was making $8.8 billion in revenue a year, thanks to a progressive web application. So that's why I fell in love with progressive web apps. So yeah, cool story, bro. Uh, hopefully you guys are not boring. Um, so main components of a PWA. Anyone knows a component of a PWA here? Nobody? You? What's your name, my friend? Boom. That's like my favorite one. So you're absolutely correct. I wish I had a treat for you, like a candy or something, but I'll give you something afterwards. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, web applications, the manifest.json, and the service workers are the main components of a progressive web application. Web applications look like any other app. If you have React, Angular, Vue, or just a plain JavaScript website, you can convert it into a progressive web app. The other cool thing about um, one of the components is the manifest.json. The manifest.json essentially tells your device, hey, this is how my progressive web application is gonna look like in your device, and this is an icon that is gonna be using whenever you install the, the app on your device. So you know, every time that you have a, an app in your device, you can see the icon and you click on it. Well, you're giving that user that native feel or native experience. That's what you're trying to accomplish with a progressive web application. The other one, the service worker. Yeah, so basically the service workers for me are the brain or um, the horsepower of the progressive web applications. Basically the service workers are a script that live in the background uh, they live in the browser, they don't live in your web application. So they actually get installed in the browser, which is very interesting, and thanks to that, uh, they're gonna be inactive, but alive all the time, even if you don't have your website open. So what are some of the superpowers of the service workers? The service workers can make network requests, they can handle how the requests are done on your website, they can make the use of the Background Sync API, which is one of my favorite APIs on the web. Basically, the Background Sync API um, allows you to interact with a website even if, if you are offline. And this is what I mean. Let's pretend that you are a professor and you go to the mountains and you have to input grades for your students. So you wanna change their grade from an A to an F just because you're so mean. And actually, you don't have internet connection because you are in the, in the mountains, right? but you still want to enter the, uh, the grades. So basically, thanks to the background sync API, you're gonna change their grades from the A to the F, and then you're gonna go back home, and the background sync API is gonna be like, hey buddy, you have internet connection now, and it's gonna do the sync, and it's gonna send the request to your database, so now your students are gonna see the updated information. So that's what the background sync API does in a nutshell. Uh, you can catch things from your website, you can catch things like videos, images, uh, network requests, uh, JavaScript files, HTML files, and so on. You can also receive push notifications when the app is not active, meaning if your website is not open, you can still get the push notification, right? Um, thanks to the caching strategies and the service workers, we can have our application working offline and you can use the service workers to display an offline page when you don't have uh, connectivity. You can capture offline metrics and you can perform load balancing on the client side. This is super interesting because the majority of the people do load balancing on the back end, right? But you, if you want to give you know, a hand to your back end, you can do load balancing on the front end because at the end of the day you can intercept the network calls and you can decide where they go. So one of the main important concepts in caching strategies and service workers is pre-cache and runtime cache. The pre-cache is basically you're putting your resources before they are requested. So a very common practice with progressive web applications is to cache the shell of your app 
and the main components of your application. For example, the navigation bar. Right before it even uh, your website is requesting the navigation bar, you're already going to have have it cached. You can cache CSS files, files like I was telling you, JavaScript files, and so on. So as you can see, the pre-cache happens at the service worker install event, which we're gonna be talking about in a sec. The runtime caching is different. Basically on the runtime caching, it happens when you are requesting a resource or an asset or whatever. Like, hey, I want to load this image uh, of me from 2019, then I go from the server, pull the data from 2019, and then I cache that, that image. Does that make sense so far? So now let's talk about the service worker life cycles. So the, the main thing that you have to do at the beginning when working with service workers is to register the service worker. So as you can see in this code, I'm checking if my navigator, in this case the browser, supports service workers. Because not all of them, like sometimes Safari versions, they don't support uh, some service workers. So that is the first thing that you want to do. Then it's very good practice for you to wait for the website to load, for you to uh, register your service worker. So load everything, then register my service worker. The next event is uh, the install service worker. As you can see, I have a cache name called my PWA shell version 1.0. You can name it however you want, doesn't matter. This is just an example. And I have an array of the files that I want to cache. As you can see, I have an HTML file, I have a JavaScript, a CSS, I have images, PNGs, and JPEGs, right? Uh, so those are the files that I want to cache in this uh, sample app. And then, when I'm in the install lifecycle, right, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna open the cache, as you can see, and I'm passing a cache name, which in this case is my PWA shell version one, Point zero, and then all these files from the array, I'm gonna pass them into that cache. So far, so good? Great. Now, activating the service worker. This is a very interesting life cycle because this is where you're gonna do the cleaning of your cache. At the end of the day, you have to be um, aware that your browser has a memory size, so you're not just gonna be able to put one gigabyte of cache in all the time and and nothing's gonna happen, so that's not how things work. So you want to make sure you clean your cache because that's one of the best practices. So what I'm doing right here is like, hey, I'm telling the browser, hey, give me every single cache um, for this website because every single website can have more than one cache. You can have like 10 of them, doesn't matter, right? And you can name them however you want. So I'm grabbing the list and I'm iterating through that list of caches and because I'm gonna do some cleanup, I want to compare the name of my caches. So as you can see, I'm comparing the cache version, which is the current one, 1.0, with a new cache, which is a version 2.0. Since they are not the same, they don't have the same name, I'm gonna be removing the old cache and I'm gonna uh, keep the, the new cache. Now, uh, when I was telling you about intercepting network calls, this is essentially how it looks like. This is a super tiny caching strategy. And basically what I'm doing is intercepting the network call, right? And if I have something in my cache, meaning that I have cached a certain asset, I'm gonna return it. And if it doesn't exist in my cache, I, I still need that image, right? I still want to display it on my website. I'm gonna grab it from the server and return it. So, all that code looks pretty ugly. To be honest, working with service workers is not easy. So that's why our peeps from Google decided to come up with an awesome tool called Workbox. Workbox is essentially a library that um, incorporates the best practices and removes the boilerplate that every single developer goes through whenever they're working with service workers in their application. So it makes our life easier. Workbox is very friendly with pre-caching runtime caching, caching strategies, backgrounds in KPI, and is very helpful for debugging. Something that is hard to do with service workers as well. So now let's talk about the caching strategies. There's like multiple of them, you can come up with your own. 
and you can combine them as well. So still well re revalidate. This is how essentially it's gonna look like. You have your website, you have your service worker, right, like living somewhere, which in this case that somewhere is gonna be the browser, and basically what I'm doing is I'm telling the cache, hey buddy, give me certain asset that I need for my website, for example, and it's gonna send it back to the web application. But if it's not in the cache, I'm gonna go to a network, which is gonna be my fallback, and then that image that I was trying to get, I'm gonna send it to the cache and to the website as well. So this is how the code looks like for the caching strategy, which is the stale while revalidate looks like without using Wordbox. So pretty complex, right? I'm, I'm not even gonna, look, I'm gonna go through the code because I don't want you to, uh, to do not use Wordbox. Um, I think you should. But this is how it looks with Wordbox. So you see the difference? So basically, Wordbox did the heavy lifting for us. So this is another caching strategy. So we have this beautiful angel right here. We're just gonna name it Jose. And Jose wants to appear on our website. And well, we have this web app. Once again, we have the service worker. And we have the cache. We do actually have Jose in the cache. And I'm gonna send Jose into my web application. But what happens if Jose doesn't exist in my cache? Right, that can actually happen. But you still need that asset. That's what I was telling you when I showed you the, the code earlier. You're gonna go to the network and send it back to your website. So it's gonna look like this. So far, so good? So, once again, this is how the code looks like uh, without Wordbox. This is how it looks like with Wordbox. As you can see, I'm using the cache first Wordbox strategy. It's as simple as that. There's another one, the network falling back to the cache. Now we have this boy called Tommy, and Tommy wants to appear on our website as well. And FYI, all these caching strategies that I'm telling you about are the main ones. These are probably the ones that I'm always gonna be using. So it's gonna be a very, very rare case when you have to customize or come up with your own caching strategy. So Tommy uh, lives in my server. I'm gonna send it back to my web app, why? Because my caching strategy is network first, and if for some reason it doesn't exist in my network, I can go to my cache and show it on my website. So once again, this is how it looks like with a Wordbox, which is not bad at all. Why? Because you're, you're doing um, some tiny coding right there for doing the fetch and, and the matching in your, in your um, cache but this is how it looks like uh, using Wordbox. This is a very common strategy when uh, working with social media, for example. You don't want to show the things in the cache unless it's like an emergency, right? But the majority of the times whenever you're working with social media, you want to show your user the most updated things on your site. So network only, super basic, I have that asset go to a network, send it back, but I don't reach the cache ever. And if you don't have it in your server, you, you're not gonna show anything because you're not reaching the cache. Just keep that in mind. Once again, this is how it looks like in Wordbox. And as you can see, I'm using the network only uh, caching strategy, which I'm importing. Cache only, you guessed it, not super complex. All I'm doing is reaching the cache. If it's in the cache, I show it in the website. If it's not in the cache, I don't have that image. So just keep that in mind. Once again, this is how it looks without Wordbox. This is how it looks with Wordbox. So now, let's actually look at some code. So, let's go here. Actually, let's go here. This application that, that you see right here is uh, a progressive web app without using Wordbox. So all the ugly code that I was showing you, I'm putting it into practice in this web application and this is how it looks like. So yeah, pretty, pretty ugly. It's very easy to make a mistake. Now imagine if you have 1,000 files that you wanna cache. 
you're gonna have to do like manually, right? Which sucks, it's not really dynamic, it's not scalable, and it's not maintainable. So that's when Workbox comes into place, and this is essentially how your application is gonna look like. If you're using uh, Create React app, they already have the service worker implemented for you. So already did the, the heavy lifting, um, they already did all the imports, the only thing that you have to do if you're using Create React app is go to this index file and change this from unregister to register for you to start using your service worker. It's as simple as that. It already comes with Workbox um, out of the box, which is amazing. And um, all this right here, this is a pre-cache, right? This is where I'm caching all the files that I want to, um, to serve even when I'm not requesting them. So if we go back, essentially this part right here is getting implemented with just one line of code. It's pretty, it's pretty slick, I think. Uh, don't really worry about this. This is just like some um, fancy stuff that kids from, from Facebook are doing. But um, in this case, for example, I'm caching all the images that um, end with the JPEG extension. By default, Create React app is caching things with PNG. And I know that some people here are not gonna be working with Create Re React app, and that's 100% fine. You can use Workbox with any uh, new framework, so keep that in mind. And as you can see, I'm uh, making sure that I don't have more than 50 entries, and if I have more than 50 entries, I'm gonna be removing the images that are least recently used from my cache. Then if I keep scrolling down, this is a custom caching strategy that I implemented um, using Workbox and using the network first caching strategy. So basically, I'm intercepting the network calls that end with choose.json. Super simple, super clean. So now, if we go to my actual application, here it is. So this is my super fancy, um, enterprise level uh, mobile app. Uh, it's just basically some Nike shoes that are in my, in my checkout card. And I'm gonna refresh this uh, because I, wasn't, I was working without internet connection. And well, this is how it is, right? On this side, in the, in the developer tools, you're gonna go to application and you're gonna click on manifest and you're gonna see the icons. By default, uh, React, the React team is using the React icons, which makes sense, but you can change this and you can, and you can change them and you can put any icon that you want. And this is the icon that is gonna be displayed in your, um, in your progressive web application whenever you install it in your device. Um, and then in this part right here, you can see your service worker. As you can see, it says active and it's running. That is what, it, what you want to see, that is amazing. And if we go to the caching, I have three caches. The pre-cache, as you can see, I have everything um, from my build, right? The chunk JS and all that stuff. And I have two more caches. We have this runtime caching, which is the network call to my API to retrieve the shoes uh, from my database, which in this case is Firebase. And I have my information right here cached. As you can see, it says uh, Workbox Runtime. That is the name of my cache. Can you see well? Yeah. Uh, but you can name it however you want. You can actually name it shoes. And I have another cache called Images, which is where I'm storing my Nike shoes. So if we go back up, I gave this name uh, to my cache, and I'm caching all the JPEG images from my website whenever I'm requesting them. Perfect. Uh, so another cool thing when working with progressive web applications is that you can actually do things offline. You can use your website offline. So if we go to the network tab, and right here where it says no throttling, you can click offline. Now you don't have internet connection. This is very useful whenever you're testing uh, your applications to see how they are actually interacting in other places, right? 
for example, myself, I'm Mexican and I want to make sure that my websites are working in Mexico the way I want them to work. So you can do caching strategies depending on the internet connection. So if you want to test them on a slow internet connection, you can do slow 3G, fast 3G, and so on. So right now it's offline. So as you can see, I refresh the website and I'm still seeing the shoes. Anyone knows why? Boom, there you go, because I cache things, right? So thanks to the caching strategies, I'm still able to see things even that are, should be being pulled from, from the server. And the, on this side, this is very interesting. So let's look at the, this right here. These are the shoes that I cached. And if I go to headers, you see everything is good. But um, in this part right here, you see where it says size, and it doesn't really have a number. It actually says service worker. And the reason is because it's actually pulling that information from the cache, not from the network. The same with the images, right? I have my Nike shoe right here coming. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, have, I have my Nike shoe coming from my service worker, which in this case is coming from the cache. So very cool. Mm, let's see. Mm. Another cool thing is I'm going to put my application back online. Mm, no throttling. And I refresh it, and everything is, again, there like nothing happened. All right? So sometimes your users are not even going to notice that they are offline. Why? Because they keep using your app like, like nothing. Like nothing happened, nothing got interrupted, which is amazing. So you can already see the benefits from using progressive web applications. So now imagine that this is an actual online store from Nike, right? They're gonna go to, um, one of your users is gonna go to the Nike store and they're gonna be able to continue with their uh, purchase workflow and get their shoes that they want. And their experience is not gonna be interrupted by the, by the internet connection. So as you can see, another cool thing that we were talking about uh, progressive web applications is installing your progressive web application into your device. So if you have a Mac and you're using Chrome, you're gonna see a similar icon to this one right here. So um, you're gonna click this icon, and this is the icon that is gonna appear in your device. And this is the super fancy name that I gave to my application, which is create React app sample. And I'm going to click install. And this is how my application looks like now. And in the bottom, I can see the icon now. So now anytime, I can just click on this icon, and my application is going to open, like if, it, like if it was a native application. The cool thing about this is you're only using JavaScript or your favorite JavaScript library or framework. So you don't have to worry about hiring an Android developer and things like that. One of the questions that you may have, well, Pato, when should I use uh, or when should I build a, net, a native application and when should I use a progressive web app? In my personal point of view, if you don't need a lot of resources uh, from your device, like a game, go ahead and build a progressive web application. Also, some people from Google say that every single website should be a progressive web app. Like, there's not really a reason why you shouldn't want to improve the user experience of your, of your visitors, right? So, it just really having a progressive web app is not gonna affect you. So just keep that in mind. And, um, what else? We're gonna go back to this. So this, there's this website called Can I Use? And this website is going to help you see what things from, uh, from the internet whenever you're developing apps are available in different browsers. In this case, I'm searching for the service worker API, and I can see if it's compatible uh, with different browsers and what devices, for example, Safari on iOS, Samsung Internet, Chrome, and so on. So these are the resources. If you want to take a picture, 
feel free to go ahead and scan the QR code. It's gonna take you to the presentation. Hopefully you liked it, hopefully you learned something new, and hopefully you start using progressive web applications today.